Hey there guys, welcome back. What you're looking at here is a new kind of launch vehicle I'm building for the first time. Uh, let's just get rid of this, it's got a big main stage or KW rocketry and then it tapers into the top. Oh, engine there. And we've got this nice FASA launch tower. I, I said I was taking the FASA mod away but I've just got to keep the launch towers. And then it's got this uh, orbital stage here. And then again the KW fairings at the top. And what this is, this is the Thor Delta launch vehicle. And I'm going to be using it to launch my version of Telstar, which was the first real communication satellite, especially the first commercial communication satellite. So here's my Thor Delta. And let's get ready to launch it. The Thor Delta was very, you know, it wasn't an amazing launcher. It was the first of the Delta family, which have gone on to be more famous, but uh, I mean this rocket variant itself launched the first British satellite, Ariel 1, um, and and this one, Telstar, which, which uh, I'm going to use to show an example of different kinds of orbits that are used in real life and obviously that you can imitate in Kerbal Space Program. We're not going to watch the whole flight, we're going to zoom through quite a lot of it at quite high speed, this is it running at four times speed now, and I'm just going to pitch over to about 43 degrees, because that's the actual inclination of Telstar. Telstar only operated for about a year, but uh, in that time it provided um, communications, transatlantic communications. So, as you can see, this is just a fairly standard Kerbal Space Program orbit. You boost up to above 70,000 and then you circularize. The thing to remember is I've got remote tech on now, so I need to do all of this within the site of the Space Center, which is why I'm pitching down towards the planet now and giving it a full burn, so that I can properly circularize it before the Space Center drops over the horizon. Okay, it's not exactly circular, but we can do something about that as we spin around. Now, this 45 degree low altitude orbit is pretty much what Telstar has. And the problems with that are that you only get about 25 minutes coverage a day if you're lucky. Uh, well, not every day, every... you get like 30 seconds every 90 minutes, which is its rotational period of the Earth, which means that throughout the whole day, sure, you get your 50 minutes or whatever, but at a time, that's only a few seconds. Or, or a few minutes, maybe. And that's one reason why... For communication satellites, you do have a lot of them in these low orbits that crisscross over each other, but mostly they um, are used for then furthering the signal on to satellites that are further out. So, there we go. We're just circularizing this orbit now before we actually deploy Telstar, or Curbstar, I believe I have called it. So, yeah, and as you can see at the top, the, the battery is diminishing quite a lot. I have covered this vehicle in solar panels, which means that it's got great coverage during the sun, because it's spherical, it's always got contact, but as soon as it goes behind the planet, it, it just dips and gets destroyed. Which again was a real limitation with Telstar, you had to be on the day side and had to have it overhead. Which again, due to its high inclination, means that if you're not rotating at the right time, it could be in the southern hemisphere when you're in the northern hemisphere, which is a big problem for satellites, because they are locked into into their orbital ring, otherwise they'd have to spend a lot of fuel maneuvering about. So yeah, as you can see, the yellow line is the connection we have, and as soon as we dip around, it will break off. So I think this is just me finalizing the orbit for, for the last time. Because this is the first satellite I've put into orbit, it means I've got no other satellites to feed from for doing my network, so I can only do it when I'm over the space center, when I have battery, and that, like I say, the yellow line appears, and I have literally that kind of pizza slice angle of, of useful time, and again, it's just about sunset, so anyway, this is my version of Telstar. It's not brilliant, it, but then again, it's not supposed to be, and I'm trying to work out the best system for what I'm going to do in my historical playthrough, and also for my new career mode, because there are many different types of orbits, and 
This one might be the easiest. But I don't think I can really use it. Maybe I would use it in the same way I had a ground-based platform in my earlier videos where I had one on the ground, but the problem with that was that it was clipping and exploding every five minutes, so I had to keep resetting it. I could have something like that with a massive antenna in low orbit to pick out the, the Beyond Dune transmissions. And then feed that maybe back up to a another satellite or have a ring of them around. I, I, I'm not quite sure yet. But oop, there we go, we've just deployed Telstar with a massive, massive decoupling explosion. And this is all it is, it's a ball. And Telstar is, I believe, as of today, still in orbit, in its very low orbit, so it's done incredibly well to not get dragged into the atmosphere. But there we go, it just zips around very close to the planet. And as you can see, it's covering a lot of terrain. Which means that if you're on one spot, this satellite can't actually give you any coverage for more than a few seconds. So you would need a whole network of crisscrossing Telstars with maybe 20 of them in each ring. So this is where my Delta D version of a rocket can provide us with some assistance. This rocket is launching a Curbcom, which is my version of a Syncom rocket. And this one is heading for a much higher orbit related to the Kerbal surface. This is going to try and get all the way to geosynchronous orbit. So let's just, again, speed this up a bit, because this is something you really... I mean, you might be interested, but, you know, let's run it at two times, because it's it's a straight up and down kind of affair. Problem is, again, with remote tech, that you can't have a nice shallow burn, because you need to get all the way up to geosynchronous in, in one burn, really, otherwise you'll end up not circularizing your orbit which will just bring you into a fiery death. So this is again all, all KW rocketry parts. I've, I've tried to phase out the FASA as much as possible, and in fact since this video I've completely reinstalled Kerbal Space Program and just put the the launch clamps on and nothing else. So there we go, we're now up to our geosynchronous transfer stage. The actual probe has got quite a lot of um, fuel on it, so it, it can take care of itself. This stage is just going to get it up to the 2.8 million meters that you need for a geo, geosynchronous orbit in Kerbal Space Program. And I'm being very careful here. I'm saying geosynchronous, because anything that has a 2.868 meters, I believe, 2,868,000 meters, is geosynchronous. It can be at any inclination. What it means is that at the same point every day it will be overhead. And that's fine for a network. As long as you've got enough of them talking to each other, that is absolutely fine. In fact, it doesn't even need to be that high. I mean, I probably, when I'm doing my game, I'm going to set up a network about 250,000 meters so that the omnidirectional antennas can communicate with each other. And that way you only need probably about four satellites in a ring around, at right angles, around Kerbin, and you've got a fully working connection. Geosynchronous isn't that necessary in that case, as long as you have one satellite that you can always reach from a long distance, you can connect around the ring and back to the space center. But for many purposes, it's good to have a direct line of sight straight back to the space center, and that's what I'm trying to arrange here. So, we're building it up now. And again, I'm, I'm worried that by the time I get there, the space center will have dipped around and I won't be able to do anything about that. So the more I burn, I'm about to have a proper orbit now, just from one burn. Highly elliptical, obviously, but it's still going to be just about above 70,000, so that's where I'm going to decouple. And it looks like I timed my fuel perfectly for that, so I'm quite happy. And this is my version of Simcom 3, which is the first geostationary satellite, not geosynchronous, geostationary, which means it's on the zero degree, it's, it's on the equator, so it's not just above the same point every day, it's above the same point continuously, it doesn't oscillate. And it, this has got enough fuel in it, it's basically just two, two fuel tanks with some solar panels, an engine, and an antenna, which could be a good basis for my real 
ones. I might do in the next episode a system of Syncom 3. I might do that behind the scenes. You don't necessarily have to see all that. But the reason I'm showing you this is because the orbit's incredibly important if you're using remote tech for allowing you to plan probe maneuvers on the moon because you need a direct line of sight to control them at all times. And as well, there's a lot of lag. If you if you do straight from the, the Kerbal Space Center to the moon, there's, there's like, you know, it's not a lot of lag, but it's enough to ruin your day. So the closer you can have a satellite, the, the better probably. Obviously then there's the transmission time between satellites and stuff like that that you've got to take into account, but you know, the, the important thing is line of sight, and that means that I can do the historical um, soft landings on the moon, the sample returns, the rovers, all these kinds of things, which were going to be in future episodes. As well as that, I think next video, because it's already up to about 11 minutes at this point, I'm going to be showing you something called a Molnir orbit, which is the solution that the Russians had to keeping a satellite over your position for as long as possible if you are far from the equator. But as you can see here, I'm just playing with the remote tech to circularize it, but I keep kind of either running out of solar power or the, the planet's rotating too fast, so I can't exactly circularize, but what I do is at each point I just spin around either prograde or retrograde and burn to get up to that magical number, I think it's 2868750, I believe. I'm going to be completely honest, when I do this in a save game, what I do is I get it there, and then I go into my quick save, and I edit the numbers manually so they've got exactly the same orbital period. I don't change the altitude or anything like that, I just make sure that they've got the same orbital period so there's no drift. Because by the time you get out to duel with a probe, sometimes you have all your four satellites on top of each other. If you do it like nearly perfectly, but do it manually, it's just not perfect enough sometimes. And of course it's very fiddly, so yeah, this is why I'm showing you this in one video now. And then I think I'm going to build my network on my own. But if you really, really want to see it, leave a comment, let me know. And I'll, I'll at least show you the build process of the probe I've got, so you can see how to build your remote tech. Um, probes, they actually work and communicate with each other. And th the more difficult thing is, if you want to put it straight over the space center, you need to circularize your orbit to exactly the right altitude when you have got yourself at 90 degrees to the surface right above the space center. It's incredibly difficult. But it's what they did. And Syncom itself, which I say was the first, um, first geosynchronous... Syncom 2 was geosynchronous... Syncom 3 was geostationary, and they were used for TV broadcasts. Um, NASA was the main operator, but the US military also got in on it as well. Um, and there were like, it allowed, like, for example, Kennedy to communicate different heads of government and things like that. They had their own channel. And then, you know, low quality TV was passed through it. Um, and yeah, Syncom 3, which is basically what this one is, was used to broadcast the 64 Olympics from Tokyo. So that's the the um, the first live television program for across the Pacific Ocean, even though like there was, I think, Relay 1, I think, broadcast. But that was a pre-recorded program. So yeah, it was turned off in 1969. That was only five years of use, but uh, it's still there. It's It's in orbit. Um, it's drifted a little bit, but there you go. That's basically Syncom 3. I'll probably do something like a bit more updated version of this. Um, I'll show it to you. I'll let you know what it is, what it's a, a imitation of, um, and I'll tell you exactly how I've decided to plan that orbit. But stay tuned for next time, because I'm going to show you the launch of the first Molnia satellite, which is what the Russians did, and it's uh, an amazing idea for maintaining Northern Hemisphere satellite connection. And I'm going to be doing Zond, which was a Russian mission to launch random animals to the moon and back. And it's the first use of a Soyuz-based craft to carry living animals. So that's next time, folks.
Hey guys, if you liked the video, remember to like and subscribe so you can help out the channel and you can also get my newest videos whenever they're submitted. And if you like these amazing people, you can head over to Patreon and you can help on my channel from as little as one oozed per video. And you can set monthly spending limits so it's never a problem. Thanks guys, see you later.